Well, hello, and welcome to another episode of The Pro Show. This month is Black History Month, February 2022, and we want to make sure that we show you some of the iconic people that are from Texarkana. There are even people that you wouldn't even think came from this idyllic place that I call home, Texarkana, Texas. And this is going to be a special edition that we're going to start it off with by featuring my mother, Patsy Ruth Gamble Oliver. My mother was not only a housewife, a mother, grandmother, but she was also an activist. And that came from her wanting to have the American dream. Everyone wants the American dream. The house, the fence, the backyard, a place for her where she loved gardens, she loved nature, she loved animals. She even had a pet chicken named Puddin' Tang. But my mother loved the outside and she uh, was always raised around um, things like that on our farms and, and all of our relatives' farms. So she got to play uh, with the piglets and you know other animals out there. And she taught me about the different groupings of animals when I was very, very young, as well as you know with my other brothers and sisters. But one of the things that my mother was, was that she was a woman of action. She didn't like to talk about doing something. If you want to get it done, you get it done. You can make a difference. And there were many times during the era that she was raised that I'm sure she was tested on those, that very mantra, but um, it ended up that my mother had to become, and she did, did become, a major leader and a force with the Environmental Protection Agency, as well as fighting folks and government offices right here in our own city. So how did that begin? Well, this is a story about my mother, Patsy Ruth Gamble Oliver. Most of her environmentalist friends call her Patsy Ruth Oliver. But my mother was born in Texarkana in 1935, and she excelled in school. She was a graduate of Dunbar High School in 1954. Uh, my mother also was active in high school as I was. She was in the band, she played the horns and the cymbals, and she was a majorette. She was also a tomboy. I wonder where I got that from. But uh, my mother was only one of two children. She had a baby sister named Margie. And my Aunt Margie played the part. Now here's the thing. In the tribe, Native American tribe, and I'm sure in many other family homes, you have the oldest, that's an important birth, and you have that baby in the family. My Aunt Margie was the baby of the family, so she was spoiled quite, quite a bit. Um, in my family, I'm the baby girl, so I'm the youngest in my family of the girls. I do have a baby brother, but it means something, and they take it very seriously. Family is everything, everything. And I come from a very, very, very large tribal family of Choctaw and Cherokee here in Texarkana. So much so that as I was being raised in Rose Hill, there were so many different tribes that you had to know who you were associated with, what tribe you were associated with, so that if you wandered off, one of the mothers or the elders would say, oh no, oh that's Patsy's, that's Patsy's daughter, or that my grandmother, her name was Maddie, they called her Miss Maddie, oh that's Maddie's, that's Maddie's grandbaby, that's that Choctaw tribe. That's the way we communicated. Also one of the most important lessons mother taught me about family was that you must know your history, and you must know your family members. Why? Because there's so many of us, you could end up, as she would say, you would end up marrying one of your own relatives and wouldn't even know it. Or you could end up killing one of them and wouldn't even know it. Knowing your family, your history, is very, very paramount in my family, which is why, as the historian of my family to this day, we've traced it and we still have it over 500 years of our history, of our rich family tree. My mother was also, as they say, she was um, a witty person. She loved humor. That's why I get my sense of humor. My, my mother would have a joke every day. She, have you heard the latest joke? Let me tell you this one. And I have to sit there. Now, when I was younger, I didn't understand her sense of humor. I go, Mommy, I don't get it. Because all we talked about it was in riddles as children. But as I got older, I, I understood her jokes and I loved them. She was, she had a, a devilish sense of humor. She was mischievous. And she was one of those loving mothers that 
no matter if I did wrong, whenever I did wrong, or even when she punished us. You had to sit after that punishment and sit and listen to that life lesson of why and what I did was wrong and how to not do that or repeat it again. That's the kind of mother I had, very loving. She also liked to pinch my behind. That was her way of saying I love you. When I had my back to her doing something and I jump and go, mama, why'd you do that? She go, cause I love you. Or you catch her sometimes, she's standing, see me across the room doing something, you know, just looking loving to her and she go, come here. I go, did I do something wrong? Just come here. Did I give you a kiss today? I go, no, you didn't. Well, give me some sugar. <laughs> that was my mother. And I'm going to tell you, she was so popular. She was so popular in uh, Rose Hill. We lived in Stevens Court. Uh, she had a lot of friends, many friends. So I was never one of those children that didn't have somebody to play with uh, or someone to meet. But you knew your place in that rank structure and you were very respectful to your elders. She taught you that too early on. So there came a time that uh, with all the teachings and life lessons that my mother would give me, my mother was a very religious woman. She used parables from the Bible and she teach it from the Bible. And uh, I loved it. I loved the way she taught us. And the thing was, uh, it was by the time my eldest sister was away from home and my second eldest sister, Vivian Elaine Gray, was gone. It was just now my oldest brother, Gregory, then it was me, my baby brother, and guess what happened? We gained another individual. <laughs> my first cousin, he was an only child, Don, Donald George. Now most people in school thought he was my brother, but he was my first cousin, Marge's only son. And the way that it came that he <laughs> started living with us is he came to spend the night, um, had so much fun with all of our friends that when it was time to go home, he cried and he cried and he put on fit. And my mother said, now listen, just let him stay one more night. He stayed one more night and that one more night turned into the rest of my life. My cousin was now an official part of my immediate family. So most folks thought he was my brother, but Don was my first cousin. So now I got three boys around me and I'm the only girl. Go figure. Uh, I wanted to play the sports that they played. I wanted to do everything that they did. If they could do it, I could do it better. And I was usually very good at it, and I beat them. My mother also had the dream of moving out of Stephen Court. She did not like the environment. She loved the people. She said, I, I, it wasn't that I hated it. I just wanted to have my own yard, my own uh, garden where I could grow things because we were restricted living in government project housing. So in 1967, my mother had the opportunity to achieve her dream. She had heard through the grapevine that they were going to build these brand new brick homes, ranch style homes in a place called Carver Terrace. And that they were taking applications now and the developer, Sam Weissman, uh, Copper's um, company, they were the people who were going to develop this, this 62 acres of land. So my mother, being who she is, <laughs> she got off work and she told me, she said she walked right over off Milan Street to this little white building that was sitting out there. And there weren't many homes at the time, may have been maybe four or five homes, but they really hadn't started on the particular house that my mother wanted the land to be. And she says, I said, well, mom, how, what did you do? How did you say it? She said, I walked in there and I said, listen, uh, I want a, I need a, I want a new home. I need a new home for my children. They need to have a dog and I need to have my garden. And you know, she's on and on. And it's, <laughs> I can even see this, this, this white man sitting there going, okay, well, that's what we're here for, but you'll have to put a different amount of money down and we'll hold. She said, I don't have any money. She said, wait a minute. <laughs> Mother said she went in her pocket and all she had was $5, $5. She said, here, $5. <laughs> I'll bring you the rest when I come back. Whatever that was, but the way that my mother's, if you have to know her wit and her charm, you'd understand she wasn't going to accept no for an answer. <laughs> so, <laughs> $5 got my mother the opportunity to achieve the American dream. And when she told me that story, I said, Mom, the man took five. She said, he couldn't help it. I pushed it out there to him. I got up and I left. And uh, she told me, he said, well, now, someone with as much uh, uh, attitude as yourself, I can't say no to you, so ma'am, you, you bring me the rest and we'll work this out. And that's one of those stories that I, I love telling people that when you're determined to do something, you'll do it. 
one of the things that I loved about it is that um, I was asking mother, I said, now when you got over there, what, what year was this? And I, she said, well, um, I had gotten off work, but the year before that they were talking about it, but we didn't see any action in this particular area of Carpentier. She said, but when I heard more than one person talking about, I'm going to get me one home, oh, I want to get me one. She said, she put it, she put it in action. It was 1967. I was eight years old at that time, eight years old. And I spent all my life, I was born in Stevens Course in Rose Hill. And uh, I attended Theron Jones School, and I was in second grade. I thought I was gonna spend the rest of my time in Rose Hill, but that didn't happen when my mother bought her new home. My mother at the time, when she bought that home, was 32 years old. So here's a black woman, we were colored back then. This colored woman buys a new brick home, all brick, all the way around, and she's proud of that. And now they're telling her, well now, we're gonna also develop this land and if you know any other uh, individuals that's interested, let them know. So word spread like wildfire. And in no time, they had so many homes and so many people, so many black people were just excited. They're going to build homes for us that uh, we can live in because you have to remember the times. You know, these are the early 1960s. The civil rights movement is happening. And I can tell you that the times of my life that I was there, I didn't know that there was a thing called a segregation line. Now, I live right off Milam Street, and anyone in Texas County can tell you it's a very busy thoroughfare. But across the street were white people. There was this invisible line of, of discrimination I didn't know about. But we play with these white children every day. They come over on our side to play, and we go on their side to play. And that happened every day. And so you, one would have to think to yourself, yes, American dream, what is the American dream? To my mother, it was owning your own home, having your own backyard and a place to have your garden, your flowers that you could see every day. But then I looked it up too. I wanted to see what the dictionary meaning was for the American dream. And this is how it goes. The American dream is the belief that anyone, regardless of where they were born or what class they were born into, can attain their own version of success in a society in which upward mobility is possible for everyone. The American dream is achieved through sacrifice, risk-taking, and hard work rather than by chance. That's my mother wrapped all up in one, as it is many Americans. If I work hard, I should be able to achieve at least something I can say that's my own and that I work hard for. Nothing was given to me. That's the type of mentor that I had always seen in my mother. She was a hard worker, a hustler. She made money on the side baking cakes and fixing people's hair. The only beautician I've ever had is one, and my mother didn't have time, and that was Miss Dolly Rhodes. And Miss Rhodes uh, lived in Rose Hill, so many of the women and people and men in my neighborhood of Rose Hill were business people. I mean, they made it happen. That dollar stayed in our community, and we were one. And I remember my mother uh, pressing my hair. You know, we didn't have perms and things like you all have today. My mother had to press my hair, and oh God, anyone that's ever had that done to them, they could tell you when they get back there close to the neck, it's an experience. <laughs> but when she got the opportunity to finally uh, get a chance to achieve the American dream, my mother planted her garden of vegetables. Um, she had flowers back there. I remember we had potatoes, tomatoes, cantaloupe, everything. And my mother wasn't the only one. It's the custom of our people to uh, grow your own food. It was so many uh, in my family that I knew of, especially those that uh, had farmland, they grew everything. Only thing that they had to go to town for was sugar or maybe some flour. Everything else we, uh, we attained on our own by growing our own products and our produces. So in 1979, um, and I graduated in 1977 from Liberty Arlo High School, I had already headed off to Houston, Texas. But between that time, um, things had happened that no one could explain. 
um, people were starting to get sick. Um, there were women that were having miscarriages. Um, you would see uh, different rashes, skin rashes happening to people. As a matter of fact, it happened to me in the prime of my life at a very precious age. I was only 12 years old. And when this happened to me, it was a reaction I know now from this toxic land that I lived on in Carver Terrace. Because you see, the land had been developed over a area that used to belong to a creosote company. What is creosote? Creosote was uh, a very, very poisonous toxin that had a mixture of different dangerous chemicals, but it was made, it was a black, sticky, gluey type of uh, substance. And if you're anyone that ever lived in the country or lived even in the city uh, of Texarkana, you could notice the um, telephone poles at the bottom always had this black um, type of glue. And I remember asking my grandmother one day, why, why do they do that? What is that for? She said, oh, that's to keep the termites from eating through the wood. It's to preserve the wood. So it's very, very, very common throughout the country. And we had a creosote plant that produced that deadly chemical to keep termites off. But little, and everyone in Texas County knew about it, but little did we know that the very toxins that they produced had been saturated heavily in this land, in these six two acres. So along come, as I said, Mr. Sam Weissman, the developer in Copper, construction company they he had the bright idea great idea but wrong land low on the wrong location to put the topsoil on it make it look nice and sell you know build houses on it to a black community hmm wonder why they didn't do that to a white community that's later in another in another episode but it was a great idea and everyone jumped to that at the time but in 1979, as I stated, um, Love Canal were having problems with dioxins, um, with a company that they had been um, fighting with. And Love Canal was one of the only um, places in New York that our people, my mother, had heard about. So she began to delve into that and uh, with other neighbors who were having members of their families or a member of their family having problems, they started comparing notes. Well, my dog, my daughter's sick, or well, my uncle has this, or my dad has this, and they start putting the notes together, and it was overwhelming. My mother even had um, a thyroid problem, and then she had um, a ruptured gallbladder. I remember seeing this, these two gallbladders, they, they were huge, uh, that they saved for her and put in this little jar, and. And I said, this was inside of you, Mom? She said, yeah, that, that happened. And we had no idea because my mother was a healthy, robust woman, as was my grandmother. And I my grandmother's out there every day doing something in the garden, pulling this and pulling this. We were just active people. And uh, the health started to fail for not only my family, but for others as well. And as I told you at the age of 12, when this struck me, um, I ended up with what they call uh, Stevens Johnson's syndrome. It's a horrible, horrible disease to happen, but it's a reaction um, to something. Um, my skin bought from the inside out. I was a whole human being of blisters. Bottom of my feet were blisters. I had to tip to go to the restroom. My grandmother would help me. Um, I had no taste buds. All of my fingernails and toenails were gone. They came off. Um, my eyes stuck at night time, so in the morning, my grandmother had to use Vaseline to open them. And uh, I remember it was in October because I wanted to go to Halloween with my brothers. Yeah, 12 years old, I still wanted to do the Halloween thing, but that, that didn't happen. I was hospitalized for about two months and uh, doctors had given me a 50-50 chance to live. Uh, my mother's a nurse. And so I know, um, I remember her being in there and my temperature being so high that they just kept constantly, constantly kept bringing ice packs, ice packs, ice packs, and they just kept just, just dissolving. But um, my mother didn't give up, but I know she, she gave a prayer through one of my um, sleeps when I awakened. I, I remember seeing, waking up and hearing my mother give a prayer to God to heal me and to save me. And if he would do that, she, he would, she would make sure that I become a great woman and serve him 
the rest of my life. Two out of two out here. And I know that by the time that um, I got ready to get out of the hospital, I didn't find out until later that my mother had told all of them to take these mirrors out of here because if you even look up this disease, Stevens Johnson syndrome, it's hard. It does horrible things to your skin. And here I am, later on, I want to become a model of all things. And the first layer of my skin is gone. So I went through this, this very, very, very trying time, as I said, at the age of 12, getting ready to become a teenager in seventh grade. And I, my hair's falling out. Um, I'm, I'm just figured, you know, I, my lip is a, a, a total scar. And what does a girl like that at my age do? My loving mother made sure that not only did I keep confidence. She didn't let me go into the depressive state. The minute she came home, she had, you know, things laid out for me, my favorite cake. I mean, my taste buds started to gradually come back. And the neighbors, she wouldn't let many of them in there, only just a few, but she didn't want me to react to that. That's the kind of love I received. And that's what healed me inside. But it was also epiphany of where I became stronger. Because every day, every day, she would tell me, don't, uh -uh. you didn't change a thing in your head. You're still a smart person. You're still this person. We're gonna get through this. And I don't care if they got any type of product out there that we can get their skin, we're gonna get you back to where you can feel comfortable with your skin. And I did. So moving fast forward, in 1979, Love Canal was going through some things and people in our neighborhood were having illnesses. Mine was in my family. Um, I found out my grandmother couldn't hold down food. I'm in the military by now. My grandmother wasn't able to hold down food. My stepfather, Nathaniel, he was having thyroid problems. He even had a, um, a tumor on his kidney. I mean, they, these are healthy people that had no problems at all. All of a sudden, they're coming down with these strange illnesses. So by the time that uh, the state investigators, my mother took um, her fight to the city hall here in Texas County, Texas, and they gave resistance. Oh. As my mother said, oh, it's just another black neighborhood. They'll be all right. No, they didn't know who they were dealing with. My mother, after she saw the resistance that Texture County officials were giving her, she went and organized a group of our neighbors. They protested. She went and got signatures. She went out and got petitions. And she made, she got them together and grew, and they became a movement. That's how it started. All it takes is someone wanting to make a difference. And as she would always say in her mantra, it has to start somewhere, so let it start with me. Because my mother don't like people that talk, 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 you know, and they don't walk the walk. They can tell you what's wrong with everything. She said, well, what are you doing to make it better? What are you gonna do? And nobody was doing anything. Everybody wanted a title, but nobody wanted to do anything. That wasn't my mother. So when she organized this group, it got wind of the Gazette. And my mother had a protest in our neighborhood to where she got all the neighbors and they came out and she coined the phrase. She said, if this had been a white neighborhood, we would never have this problem. So all I see is environmental racism. Environmental racism. That is the phrase and a coined phrase that my mother coined herself. It's racism, environmental racism. And they use it to this day. In 1980, the state investigators came to inspect Carpenter's, and he said that he was so shocked by the readings of his report that he was telling um, most of the mothers, you know, you shouldn't eat from the land, and you make, well, we make sure that we had vegetable gardens to begin with. What do you mean we can't eat from the land? And she wanted to see that report. And that year of 1980, once the state inspectors came, my mother wanted the files from that study. And you know what? It took another four years, four years, for Carver Terrace to even get that report. In that report, they were so alarmed by the findings, uh, the residents there, and, and, and the causes and the effects and the illnesses that occurred that when my mother found out about it, she was livid. It, it came to be known to not only my mother, but to the residents of Carpenter's, this one important fact. Copper's company knew two things that our residents, my family, and the residents of Carpenter's did not. And what was that? 
that are pretty landscaped blood yards were saturated with creosote. And number two was that the prolonged exposure to it not only caused second degree skin burns, rashes, kidney diseases, cancers, various cancers, miscarriages, it was all there, but they didn't want us to know about it. So in 1984, the bombshell dropped for all of us in a good way because that was the year that Carver Terrace was finally placed on the Superfund list. EPA placed Carver Terrace on the Superfund list for that $9 billion trust that Congress established in 1980 to clean up toxic waste dumps across the country. Now, my mother was telling me, during this time, you know, they kept coming and they kept going, they kept coming and they kept testing. But one of the things, one of the incidents she told me about was that you started having people coming out in moon suits. Moon suits, mama? Yeah, moon suits. They were covered from head to toe in these uh, plastic suits. They had masks, rubber masks, and they had gloves. And mother said, Baby, you gotta realize this was in the summertime. You know how hot it gets down here. And she <laughs> she told me the story about feeling so sorry for this one gentleman that was near our home uh, out there working. There was quite a few of them, but this particular one, she said he, he just like he was just sweating so hard that what she did was my mother. Uh, you know she loved Coca Cola and she loved Seven Up, but and you know drinks like that of the day. So she said, let me go out here and give him something to drink, you know, to cool him down because I know that suit can't be that comfortable with the work he has to do. Mother says she went outside, had a beautiful, a nice clean glass and poured some 7-Up in a glass for him and went tapping on the shoulder, here you go, would you like something to drink, something cold? It was cold right out of the refrigerator. My mother said that man turned around and said, oh no, 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 thank you, no, I don't want to. The way she told it to me on the phone, she said, oh, I have to remember, we're on toxic land. He thought I was bringing him water. <laughs> he didn't even realize it was just a cold drink and my mother was just being compassionate, the person that she was. And uh, But that let her know the attitude and the way that we were being uh, approached about our toxic land in Carver Terrace. And in 1988, uh, EPA unveiled uh, another report on Carver Terrace. And that final report was so large, it was two volumes, as they said. It was so heavy that it was, I'm sorry, it was four volumes, but it had, it took two people to carry it. That's how much information was in this report. It took two people to carry it. But knowing my mama, I knew the minute that the report came out, she wouldn't care if it was going to take her from however long. She was going to sit and she was going to read every last page. And she was going to learn all of these, as she said, $25 words, you know, that, that would break your jawline to pronounce. I up with something else. Because after she get through, got through reading that report, uh, you got to remember, my mother had a sense of humor. She had a wicked sense of humor. That's where I get my wittiness from. I was voted, you know, most witness of my senior class. So my mother said in the report, they said, um, what we can do is come out and we are going to take that soil and um, wash it and replace it. And it's <laughs> and we're going to um, put a new layer of topsoil on this land and it should be able to be all right. So now they put up a sign in my neighborhood at the end of the road on Marlin Street and it read something like uh, contaminated soil do not enter and uh, the soil on this side is fine and the soil on that side is not. Here's my mom says to him she said our toxins down here in, 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 in our community they're very intelligent they can read and they know how to stay on one side of the fence and, and they'll go stay on the other side of the fence. It made no sense. Look at that, it was just asinine to even think that. The soil over here is great, but the soil over there is not. So my mother um, continued, and through that, she became outraged. And that's when she really uh, became the outspoken leader for Carver Terrace. Uh, 
folk and newspapers, uh, airways. Remember, we didn't have computers like we do now. Uh, that and 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 quick, uh, what do you call it, TikTok and all of this uh, that we utilize. That wasn't there. So for major news reels to get this information and to grasp this grassroots op uh, uh, organization that my mother uh, has started along with other residents in that neighborhood and particularly like Mr. Sonny Fields. I mean, those he was one of our neighbors and uh, he was one of the presidents of one of the uh, organizations that we had there. You had Herman Watson, you had um, Mr. Cheatham, you know, all of these people, they were all involved. These are my neighbors and these are people that I grew up with. They were involved. It wasn't just my mother. But my mother's voice was the one that they heard. And soon the Gazette was out there after my mother had um, organized one of the neighborhood protesters and they captured her on the front page, utilizing her coin phrase. It's environmental racism. That's what it is. If it had been a white neighborhood, they'd have bought us out a long time ago. The only thing I see is racism. And my mother said, um, she began to fight even harder after that, and she was not gonna take no for an answer. You're not gonna treat us like we're nobody. We work hard just like everyone else, and we're Americans. They also went on, after my mother started um, leading the group, she started to raise, as they said, she started to raise pure hell with everybody. She wasn't taking any, anybody's word that they are going to do. She didn't want any lip service. She's about action. She wanted to see them do something to get us out of that toxic community. As a matter of fact, most of the, my neighbors start calling me Toxicana. Uh, twice as toxic, twice as deadly. That's, those are the type of phrases folk were using at that time. But when she told me, um, she said, let me tell you something. They gave the report about everything that's wrong with the land. But what about our health? Say anything about our health. What about our health? What about all of the illnesses we have suffered in this community? Nobody from EPA ever asked. And when she started on this crusade and, and joined people like Donald, um, Donald Preston and um, Dr. Uh, Jim Presley, it became a movement. And once it became a movement, my mother started traveling outside of Texas County and landed on the state capital of our um, of Austin, Texas, for our community. She went there many times and gave speeches, um, gripping speeches, so much so that when she would uh, come down from making a speech, she would tell me, she said, well, these people, all of these people from Greenpeace and this and that, and all these other EPA environmental places want, can you come speak at our place? Can you come visit her? Can you talk? They wanted her on their circuit. And as mother would say, and honey, once I started traveling, I mean, I'm just a housewife with my, with my children and a nurse. I just want the American dream. She said, but once I started rubbing elbows with rocket scientists and scientists and, you know, uh, EPA folk and politicians, people like uh, Governor and Richards, you know, they, they took notice. Uh, you even had uh, Jesse Jackson, the Rainbow Coalition. He even made statements on behalf of Carver Terriers. Uh, so she was uh, one of those people that, she said, I'm not impressed with these titles. I want something done for my people. That's who she was. And by the time that Texas Canada started noticing that this is not gonna go away, the developer, Sam Weissman, of all people, he says, she's a troublemaker. In that unit, when uh, someone speaks up back during that era, that's the first thing they'll say to a black woman. She's a troublemaker. She's a thorn in our side, said EPA's Roger Makem. He's in, uh, I guess he was in Dallas, Texas. But I can remember and I can recall as well that mother said, let me tell you something. When you go and you are there with your group to a place, an organization that's supposed to be there to protect you and help you, and they lock their doors and send their employees home, that's what the EPA in Dallas, Texas did to my mother and her group. They, 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 she was so powerful with her voice and had such uh, 
movement with everything that she was doing, these people could not deal with my mother. And they didn't want to deal with her. But she had America looking and listening. At this same time, the, my mother was saying that I noticed that the EPA movement was white. I said, Mom, what are you talking about? She said, it's white. She said, most of these meetings and boards that I go to, I'm usually, I used to feel like I'm the fly sitting here in the buttermilk. I went, what? She said, yeah, I used to be the only black person there. And that had to change if we're going to make change. Because if you're suffering, I'm suffering too. And through that, um, as I said, she would tell me that I had to make sure to let them know my voice is still here, but I made many great allies along the way, many of them. And that's what kept her motivated to continue. By the time that she had met up with uh, Jesse Jackson, she was saying, making her other famous phrases. She said, oh, we don't have the complexion for protection, but we're gonna continue to fight. Because you see, once my mother felt that, you know, we don't have the, com the complexion for the protection, she knew that once she read that line in the report, this is what they said about the vegetables being grown. Further reading stated that eating vegetables grown in contaminated soil could be harmful. But only one resident, one resident in Carver Terrace has been observed to have a vegetable garden. My mother hit the fan. She blew up. Because not only did she have a garden, but most of our neighbors grew plants and vegetables and gardens in the neighborhood. That's the custom. She knew it was an outright lie. And she was living. So once she started protesting again to the EPA, they came back and wrote to my mother and they insisted, the EPA, they insisted that, well, no, um, you can't compare yourself to look now because um, uh, don't even think about a thing called vibe because it's not warranted. For you. Oh, really? You're talking Pastor Ruth Gamble all over. You're telling the wrong person no. And my mother went about and said, we're not going to use this as an excuse. It's exactly the same thing. You're killing people and people are dying. So one thing she told him when she approached EPA here, she said, one thing I do know about um, excuses and this is not an excuse and the only distinguishment that i can make between carver terrace and love canal is racism and she said and i know about it because i have a degree a phd in jim crow i know it when i see it my mother from that point on became so fabulous and famous uh when she started fighting the epa and going through um, these different areas across the country, especially down in the Southwest, uh, helping others fight, but also promoting Carver Terrace, it was game was on. You were gonna stop it. She went and started pounding on doors, getting petition signed, organizing a network of mothers. Uh, and again, she's always situated to where she was in some major magazine um, then she hit uh, she did so much work and spoke so highly she became so popular that here she's landing in Washington DC and she also landed uh, on uh, what they call a VH1 um, video and VH1 back then was like the place to be I guess MTV and all of that it's brand new but uh, they have my mother, and if you uh, are out there on the uh, internet and you have YouTube, you can just look it up, Patsy Ruth Oliver. It'll be right there, the very VH1 video that they made of my mother. And um, she was featured not only there, but she was also in Essence Magazine, Magazine Ebony Magazine, and the wonderful Alexis Jetter uh, 
wrote a beautiful, beautiful story about my mother. Um, and um, I'm, I'm, I just loved every word that she wrote. She, she really caught the spirit of my mom, as they say, because she came down here to Texarkana and spent some time with my mother. So uh, we talked about that, and, 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 I, and I know her. I've never met her, but I cannot wait to meet Alexis Jetter because it's one of the quotes that uh, they used across um, the news when my mother passed away. They used one of Alexis's quotes. But in 1990, um, Congress appropriated $5 million to purchase the homes in Carver Terrace. Now, mind you, and that was to really relocate our community, and mind you, during that time, I'm in the military, but I remember my mother coming up to Washington, D.C., to Congress, and of course, her baby, her baby girl is there. She's gonna stop and see me, and we spent some time together. But I had no idea the depth and, and the magnitude uh, of positions that my mother was in and a part of at that time. My mother um, was also one of the people, one of the first black women um, that they had named to be on the board of the Friends of the Earth, my mom. And now she's beginning to get positions like being vice president of this or vice president of this organization. And, and I'm thinking, wow, mom, you're doing some great things here and you're traveling. She said, but baby, I know what hell looks like. I'm like, what do you mean? She said, no, there's a place uh, in, they call it Matamoros, Mexico. And she said, when I went there, I saw dead animals in the water, raw sewage, she said, you, you, you can't even imagine how these people were living and how they treated them. Uh, she also rallied against uh, operators in Jacksonville, Arkansas, Agent Orange factories, and against water contamination. And my mother was serving on the National Toxic Committee as an officer when I was in the military. I didn't know that. Against Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. Yeah, military bases have contamination. And people that are living on the bases there are drinking contaminated water and don't even know it. Now, if you can't trust your own government, the United States government that you're here to serve your country, to take care of you, and you don't say anything about it, it doesn't get any worse. It really doesn't. And I served two tours at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, not knowing my mother and her committee and the organizations were also studying them about poisoned water for those that lived on the base. And I wanna say right now too, many of those that were during that time serving and living on base at that time, not only have lost loved ones, but some are still suffering from the effects of the contamination from Camp Lejeune. So now it's in 1993, my uh, mother is finally getting a chance to move out, she's moved out, she wanted to be the last one, she wanted everybody else to move out of Carpenters before her. And when she did, she bought a beautiful new home, built it the way she wanted it. I got a chance to, to see it and, and I was so happy for her. Things in her personal life, happiness was coming again. She had, she, the American dream was there for her once more. She believed, she was, she was happy. My stepfather, oh, he started his garden. Things were great. But then, I was stationed in Okinawa, Japan during that time. I was there from 1990 to 1993. So in 1993, when my mother uh, had built her new home, it was during this time also that um, I suffered two great losses, not beknownst to me, is that my oldest sister, uh, Stephanie, Stephanie was so sweet. That was my sweetest sister. Now, I'm the one that called the tombar. She's the dainty one, okay? <laughs> you know how it is in that brain structure of siblings. Uh, she was the dainty one, and she looked exactly like my mother. And she was built exactly like my mother. Tiny waistline, beautiful full legs. I didn't get them, but that's okay. <laughs> but I love my sister. And uh, my sister unexpectedly had an aneurysm. Now, mind you, at this time in 1993, I'm getting ready to, and it was time for me to leave uh, Okinawa, so I was already getting ready. I had orders to leave to come back to the States. But during that time, it was October, um, 
Red Cross, anyone in the military knows you have to go through Red Cross. And generally, they don't let you go to funerals or home unless you really get the special permission uh, or it's the really, really next to kin, like a mother, grandmother, father, that sort of thing. Cousins and things like that, they don't know. They, they won't do it unless, I, like I said, you get special permission. But when uh, Red Cross got a hold of me and said, um, your mother um, has requested your presence and, and so forth and so on, um, I, I, I was thinking, what are they, what's, what's happening? My sister's healthy. She's fine. What's going on? But my sister had suffered an aneurysm. And um, at the time, I believe she was working at I want to say what they call shop saver or something of that, but it's a Walmart now on the Arkansas side. But she was a cashier there working part time. And my mother told me that she had told her that day, she kept saying, I got a headache. My head is hurting. My head is hurting. And I've never had a headache like this. And so those were some of the early symptoms for her. By the time I arrived in the States, my mother, um, I kept up with her. We didn't have cell phones like we do now. So wherever I could get, and uh, I did have a cell phone, you know, one of the newest ones. It was kind of bulky and big, but my mother uh, had one too, and uh, we kept in touch. I would let her know, I'm on this highway. I'm, I mean, it was like, you know, detailed minute by minute. And when I arrived in Texture County, my mother was standing down uh, the, on the bottom floor of the hospital waiting for me. And of course, we embraced, and, and she, as a nurse, said, I want to prepare you for this because I'm thinking my sister's gonna be fine, you know, is it a stroke or something? They had said the word stroke, and I'm thinking, stroke? Well, no. But here she was only 41 years old. 41 years old, beautiful. And when I saw my sister, she was, uh, of course, uh, not away, but she, um, I, I kept looking at all the family around her. She looked so beautiful, she looked so peaceful, and she was a beautiful person. But I remember my mother just being the nurse that she was. She was checking and, and, and not saying very much. Never seen my mother like this, ever, ever. You can imagine, my mother looking at her firstborn. By the time that um, I left the room and come back, I remember I was there when my sister took her last breath. And my mother did not cry. I don't, she just didn't. That, that, that strong strength she had in her it was present, but I knew she was crushed, she was devastated, but for the family, she kept it together. 1993 was just not one of my favorite years because after my sister's funeral, uh, which I did speak and sing, um, I was at my mother's new home, so I got a chance to spend time with her, and I was really concerned about my mother. I was just really concerned. It was just all heavy on my heart. December 1993, on the 14th day, that evening, I'm sitting at my computer doing my work and so forth. There's nothing but business papers right there, but it was late into the night, and I'm, I just kept doing my work. And I had to pick up a, a couple of sheets of my work, and out of nowhere, flew a picture of my mother. Now, being um, the rich person that I am, I looked down and I said, well, how did you get there? I had no idea, but there was a picture of my mother, and I knew it was a sign of something to come. And so now, here it is, uh, 1990, and um, my mother, you know, prior to her moving into her home in 1993, um, kept asking, why is it taking so long to get our residents out here? What is it that's taking so long? You know, we know, we got the report, why aren't we moved? Well, one official made the terrible mistake of telling my mother to be patient. Be patient. My mother said, don't you ever use that word with me. The most patient woman I know is lying stretched out in her grave. And that was my grandmother who had passed away. And she had made a vow to my grandmother that she was going to get us out of there, out of Carver Terrace. And she told him, I want everyone else to go first. You go and you move. I'll be the last one to leave because I want to make sure that you're taken care of for us. So most of our neighbors had moved away, got new homes, built new homes, and were on their way of recovery. My mother's new home was a beauty, and I know I saw how proud she was of it, but something was broken inside my mother. So the morning that um, I went to work on the... Um, 
14th of, uh, I mean the 15th of uh, December, I was off work. I didn't have to work that day. But I remember I said, I'm not feeling quite right. And I remember the night before the picture flew out of my, out of my paperwork. But then when I went to the gym, which was nowhere, like two, three blocks from my house, I drove down there. And as I pulled into the parking lot, out of nowhere, out of nowhere, from my right comes this beautiful black bird. And during the middle of this flight, its head turned toward me, turned back, and it flies off to the left. It was such, it gave me pause. It was so, such an amazing moment that I knew it meant something, but I had to pull into a parking spot and just sit there and think, what just happened? I, I, I can't explain it. I can't explain it. But I knew that bird meant something. It meant something. And I'll never forget it. Never. I go into the gym, try to work out, wasn't doing it. I tried to work out on this train. I wasn't feeling it. It was something heavy on me. Something heavy. And I said, just forget it. I'm not, not going to even work out today. I'll do it another time. So I go back home. And when I went back home, um, my husband was at work at the time. And uh, he was retired. And he was a general contractor doing work you know, up in Springfield. But um, as I was there, the phone rings. And they tell me, um, hey, hey, we need you to come in, Gunny. For what? I'm off today. Gunning, uh, we need, just need, they made an excuse to get me to the office and I'm in civilian clothing. So when I said, okay, fine, I'll come in. I went in civilian, they said, you don't have to dress, just, just come in. Of course, uh, that's where I found the news in my officer's back office back there. Uh, my mother had passed that night. And of course I broke down. I mean, if you were anywhere near there, you would have heard me break down. My mother? No way. My mama's gone. Mm -mm. And on the phone line, they had put my sister, my other sister, Vivian, on the line. And when she confirmed, she said, best mama's gone. That was fine for me. So I planned and I got all of that together and I came back to Texarkana. But um, I can tell you that from that moment on, I knew that something in me had been sparked. Um, I too has suffered from a lot of the uh, illnesses and seeing so many of our residents and neighbors and friends suffer with it too. And many of them still carry it to this day. I mean, whether it, they got away like I did and be able to at least get some healing because they weren't still on the land, others didn't make it. And then there are some who were just fortunate and blessed that did not suffer full effects of what that land that we ate off of did to us and lived on. So I can tell you that um, my mother has left an indelible print, an indelible legacy for me and my family. But I can also tell you the same day that my mother passed away was the very same day that the Army Corps of Engineers were in Texarkana and they had just started bulldozing down my mother's house. What a coincidence. The day that they start bulldozing down our old house in Carver Terrace, my mother passed away. I um, am so proud of all of that she accomplished during this time, and it was a lot. She's appeared in magazines, Ebony Magazine, Essence Magazine, and TV shows. Um, she even received the Amway Ebony Scholarship Fund. Uh, she served as vice president of the National Toxic Campaign. She was vice president of the Texas Network for Economic Justice. And as I told you, the first black, one of the first black women named on the board of Friends of the Earth. She worked with Southwest Network for Environmental and Economic Justice. And that's where she met, I call him my godfather, Richard Jackson. I'm sorry, Richard Moore. And Richard Moore is, um, one of those people that is down near the border of Brownsville, Texas, uh, you know, Waco and in those areas. And, uh, but together they became a dynamic duo. And if I saw my mother in a picture, I'd see Richard in a picture. And I still work and talk with Richard to this day. As I said, he's like my godfather now. He, has, um, he loved my mother. They were very, very good friends. And, and I love him and I want to him to, I hope he, 
is able to see this video know that no I haven't forgot I'm keeping my word to not only to you and to mama but now you've got her granddaughter Chakta who's here and she loves it um, I never pushed this uh, environmental issue on my daughter or my children but my mother spirit is in each one of them Chakta loves the environment she loves she's a mom now you need to put that over here and put and I go well, wait a minute that's my daughter she's got her grandma's spirit and then my son heaven out of nowhere when he was two years old i gave him some rice now i'm gonna show you how things that you can't explain you just can't explain he wanted some sugar on his rice and he wanted butter i don't eat my rice that way i don't like it my husband didn't eat his rice that way he doesn't like it but we looked at each other when he asked for it that day and I gave it to him when, I, when, when he sat there and he, he ate it right up. And I told my husband, I said, you know, the only person in my family that eats rice that way is my mama. My mother loves rice with sugar and butter on it. You go figure. Because I never showed my son that. And he never saw it. He was only two years old. And as we continue um, today to honor her legacy, we are voices of a new generation. And we're gonna to continue to fight. Climate warming is real, uh, change is real, and Mother Earth needs time to heal. We need clean air, clean water, and we also need clean oceans. And me and my family, we do what we can with others across this nation, across this world, to do our part and be a part of environmental healing. And I hope you join us whenever you see us. So I want to say, as my mother would say, some people don't think that one person can make a difference. Yes, you can. I want to thank my mother for being the fighter that she was and for all the valuable lessons she taught me from the moment I could walk and talk. She made this, she said this quote, and it's still, they use it to this day. So many people don't think one person can make a difference, but really, it's how, it has to start someplace. So let it start with me. I'm honored to have been the daughter of my mother and for her to pass this on to me and to be able to know that when you open your mouth and you raise your voice, people will listen. Thank you for joining me on this episode for my mother. Thank you for joining us during this Black History Month special, special episode for Patsy Ruth Gamba Oliver, my mother. And I want you to know the show is named after her, Patsy Ruth Oliver, pro. So now you know. Be a kind of part of the pro show. We'll be here. Thank you for joining us. See you next time.